on the gift of prophecy. I believe in the blessing of the gift of the spirit of prophecy. The Holy Spirit gives you special, there's a special message. She still points us to the Lord. The gift of prophecy is about foretelling and foretelling. Welcome to the I Believe presentation series, where we are looking at the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm so glad you've joined us for today's presentation on the gift of prophecy, a very important topic or teaching for our time in earth's history. But before we get into our topic, let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for another opportunity that you have provided for us to consider your word and to consider the gift of prophecy in these end times that we are living. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us and teach us according to your word. Amen. So let us get straight into our Bible study for today. And I would like us to begin with what we covered in a previous presentation on spiritual gifts, that a spiritual gift is from the Holy Spirit. So I won't spend much time here because we have a whole presentation on this topic. But the Holy Spirit distributes gifts to God's people for the furtherance and building up of God's work on earth. Now, there are a number of important passages when it comes to spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are two of those passages, and I would like to read from those scriptures. What we will see as we read from both portions, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, is that the spiritual gift of prophecy is one of the gifts mentioned in these lists of spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. So here is Romans 12, verse 4 to 8, and I'll be using the New King James Version. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, referring to the church, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So here we see prophecy being listed. The the passage continues, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Another spiritual gift, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, He who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. A number of different spiritual gifts are listed here in Romans 12, verse 4 to 8, and one of them is the spiritual gift of prophecy. Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll read verse 4 to 11. There are diversities of gifts, or different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Not for our selfish benefit that God bestows these spiritual gifts on believers. It is for the profit of all, for the upbuilding of God's work. And here comes a list of spiritual gifts. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles. And for our presentation today, 
to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, etc. Let me end off with verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the gift of prophecy is one of the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows. And those who have been appointed as God's prophets will be endowed with a spiritual gift of prophecy. For example, teachers would need the spiritual gift of teaching and prophets for, to fulfill their function. They would need the spiritual gift of prophecy. And that's what we'll be looking at in this presentation. So let's, let's consider now how prophecy, the gift of prophecy, is an identifying characteristic of God's end-time remnant church. God's end-time people will go through very difficult times before the second coming of Jesus. We find this indicated in Revelation 12, verse 17, for example, which tells us that Satan, the dragon, was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That is the, the remnant church, the end-time remnant people of God. So he went to make war with them who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here are identified two characteristics of God's end-time people. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the gift of prophecy, and we'll see how that fits into this verse a little bit later, but the gift of prophecy will be given to them, to God's end-time people, as a special source of guidance and encouragement and instruction during the last days of earth's history. According to Revelation 12, 17, God's end-time remnant will have two identifying characteristics, as I just mentioned. They will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God's end-time remnant people will keep all of His Ten Commandments, as found in Exodus 20, verse 1 to 17, including a for, an often forgotten commandment, the fourth commandment of Sabbath observance, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And this will be characteristic of God's end time people. They will keep the commandments of God. The second characteristic, as Revelation 12, 17 mentioned, is that they will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So a question I would like us to look at in this presentation is, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? It's one of the identifying characteristics, and it is important for us to know what that is referring to. So the phrase, the testimony of Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus Christ, is used five times in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 verse 2, 1 verse 9, 12 verse 17, and twice in Revelation 19 verse 10. So let's read these passages with a little bit of context as well. So the book of Revelation begins this way. John writes, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Now, let me just pause there. This takes me back to Amos 3 verse 7 which identifies God's prophets as his servants. He says, my servants, the prophets. So let's keep that in mind as we, we continue reading here. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Many things were revealed to John in this prophecy. And God, through the spirit of prophecy brought to him by the angel, revealed these things to him. Verse 3 encourages the readers of this prophecy of Revelation Blessed is he who reads and those who hear 
the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Let's go to the second use of the, the testimony of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And let's read Revelation 1, verse 9 to 11. John writes, I, John, both your brother and companion in, tri in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John had the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, he says, and heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So John was a servant of God. He was a prophet, and he received this testimony from Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus, which was prophecy that he had received from Jesus, a message from Jesus. Let's, let's now go to the third, third use of the phrase, the testimony of Jesus. And it's the one we read a little bit earlier on. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, that is the pure church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And then Revelation 19 verse 10. Here we find two times when the phrase, the testimony of Jesus, is used. And I fell at his feet to worship him, John, after receiving what the angel had communicated to him. This, is, this was his response. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here we find a description of the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus is clearly linked to prophecy. So from Revelation 12 verse 17, we know that God's end time remnant people will have the testimony of Jesus. Which according to Revelation 19 verse 10 is the spirit of of prophecy. So God's end time people will have the spirit of prophecy. And it would make sense to me that those who have the spirit of prophecy are the prophets. The prophets would have the spirit of prophecy and the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 22 verse 8 to 10 is very, very similar to Revelation 19 verse 10. Let me read it to you. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Sounds very similar to Revelation 19 verse 10. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that. Same response as we found earlier. Uh, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So John's experience in Revelation 22 verse 8 and 9 is strikingly similar or the same as his experience in Revelation 19 verse 10. And by comparing these two scriptures, a discovery is made that confirms that those who have the testimony of Jesus are the prophets. So let me put these two verses or part of the verses side by side. You'll see the angel communicating to John said in Revelation 19 verse 10, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 22 verse 8 and 9 says, For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets. So clearly, those who have the testimony of Jesus are the prophets. The prophets have the testimony of Jesus 
which according to Luke, Revelation 19 verse 10, is the spirit of prophecy. So by, care, by comparing these, these two texts, it is clear that those who have the testimony of Jesus are clearly the prophets. Now, prophets must necessarily have the spiritual gift of prophecy, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So with all that background in mind, let's read again Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So we can conclude here that God's end-time people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, one of those identifying characteristics, the one about having the testimony of Jesus Christ, would necessarily mean that the gift of prophecy would need to be manifested among God's end time people. They would need to, it would need to be a prophetic movement. The gift of prophecy um, would need to be among them. I hope that makes sense. So in summary, God's end time people will go through very difficult times before the second coming of Jesus. But they will keep all of God's Ten Commandments. And among them will be manifested the gift of of prophecy. The messages received from God through the gift of prophecy will be to them a, source, a special source of encouragement and guidance and instruction during these last days. So let's now turn our attention to a related theme, that of the importance of testing a prophet. How do we know if someone is really speaking from God, if they really are representing or the spokesperson of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19 to 21 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. So the Holy Spirit is the one that gives prophecies. Don't despise prophecies, but we need to test make sure that this is from God. So according to this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, we are not to despise prophecy, but we are to test the prophets and their prophecies and hold on to what is good. Thankfully, in His Word, God has given us a number of tests which we need to apply to the life and the message of the prophet. If the prophet and the prophecies he brings or she brings passes the biblical tests of a prophet, we can have confidence that God has spoken through this person. So what are these biblical tests of a prophet? How are we to test a prophet and his prophecy? I would like to share four primary tests of a prophet with you. The first one is agreement with God's word. If God is communicating a message through a prophet, it makes sense that the prophet's message will be in agreement with what God has already revealed through his previous prophets and what he has revealed to us through the Bible. Now, the Bible could possibly be seen as a collection of the writings of prophets. Think of it. Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, the list can go on and on. But what we need, to, we need to test, anyone who claims to be a prophet or has a message from God, we need to test with what we know is from God, and that is the Bible. God will not contradict himself what he has already revealed in his word. He's not going to say one thing there and now change his mind. So we can check to confirm that is this message in line with what God has already revealed. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What law and what testimony is that? This is God's law and God's testimony. We need to check or compare or bring this message from what someone 
shares, and we need to test it with God's Word. Is it in agreement with the Bible? So it is therefore important to ask the following questions when testing the validity of one who claims to be a prophet. Is he or she speaking according to the Word of God? Is his or her message in harmony with the revealed will of God as found in the Scriptures? An important question. And that is the first test of a prophet. The second test of a prophet is related to the first one, but maybe more specific. Agreement with the Bible's teaching about Christ. 1 John 4 verse 1 to 3 provides us with this principle um, that is behind this test of a prophet. 1 John 4 verse 1 to 3 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we need to test. We cannot just take for granted that if someone claims to be a prophet, that we need to receive the message. We need to test first. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So in light of 1 John 4 verse 1 to 3, in light of this principle, a relevant question for us to ask is, is the one who claims to be a prophet loyal to all aspects of the Bible's teaching about Christ? Are they loyal to the teaching, the Bible's teaching about Christ? The third test of a prophet that I would like us to explore now is their fruits, the fruit of their life and their ministry. We'll base this on Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20, and Galatians 5, verse 19 to 24. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer is no. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree, tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, this is Jesus' conclusion, therefore by their fruits you will know them. So to understand this biblical illustration, let us consider how a child would identify a fruit tree. If the tree has apples on it, the child would know that it is an apple tree. If the tree, however, had oranges on it, the child would know that this particular tree is an orange tree and not an apple tree. The fruit identifies the type of tree it is. So in light of that, if there is good fruit in a prophet's life, in other words, the fruit of the Spirit, and also as we see later, we could also apply to the fruit of their ministry, he or she has passed this part of this particular test. If, however, there is bad fruit in a person's life, now if you read Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is contrasted to the works of the flesh. And there's a whole list of the works of the flesh. So that is the bad fruit. If the, the prophet's life demonstrates the works of the flesh, he or she has not passed this part of the test of a prophet. So let's go to Galatians 5, verse 22 to 24. So verses 19 to 21 speak about the works of the flesh. And then verse 22 starts with the word but, contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
John 15 is also helpful in this regard, which teaches us that good fruit can only be produced in one's life if you are vitally connected to Christ, who is the vine and we are the branches. It is through connection with Jesus that good fruit is born in our lives. And I think it is reasonable to expect that a prophet, a prophet of God needs to be connected vitally to Jesus. So a question we need to ask then when testing a prophet in this regard is, number one, is the prophet bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life? Or is he or she bearing the works of the flesh? And secondly, coming to the fruit of their ministry, what are the effects of his or her ministry on the cause of God, the work of God, and on the lives of those who accept his or her teachings? Those who consider this person a prophet and are applying what they are teaching, what do their lives look like? Are they being, becoming more and more Christ-like or not? This would be considered part of the fruits of their ministry. So in other words, is the one who claims to be a prophet leading his hearers closer to Jesus? Are those who accept his or her message growing in Christ-likeness or not? And then number four, the fourth primary test of a prophet that I'll share with you today is fulfilled predictions. Deuteronomy 18 verse 21 and 22 and Jeremiah 28 and verse 9 supply us with this test of a prophet. Deuteronomy 18 verse 21 and 22, And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Jeremiah 28 verse 9 says, As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Fulfilled predictions. So a question that arises from these Bible passages is this. Have the prophecies of the one who claims to be a prophet been fulfilled? Now there is a, a note that I need to share with you as quoted here. And this note says, This test is not conclusive for the following reasons. We mustn't base everything just on this one. We need to look at all the tests of a prophet. But this one, there's a, there's a note. There, this test is not conclusive for the following reasons. Number one, Satan through a false prophet or a medium may predict something that will happen. You can check the scriptures that are referenced there. And secondly, there may be conditional aspects to a prediction made by a true prophet which may cancel its fulfillment. If it's a conditional prophecy and the condition is met, that will change, that will con that will change the outcome. So if it is a conditional prophecy, then, for example, in the case of Jonah, Jonah said 40 days and God would destroy the city, but they, they repented truly, they changed their, their ways and God was merciful to them. So apart from these two considerations, a true prophet's predictions will come to pass. So now I would like us to, to come back to the end time context in which we are living and how this gift of prophecy will be manifested amongst God's end time people. And I would like us to look at the gift of prophecy and the ministry of Ellen White. Now, Ellen White lived from 1827 to 1915 and was one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that the gift of prophecy was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. So, in light of what we've just heard regarding the four primary biblical tests of a prophet, 
one would therefore need to apply these biblical tests to, to Ellen White and her ministry and her prophecies. If her life and messages pass the biblical tests, we can have confidence that God has used her as his messenger. And we should take heed to the messages that God has given us through her ministry. If, however, she does not pass the biblical tests, we are not to take heed to her messages. So to apply these biblical tests, I recommend that you read Ellen White's writings for yourself. There is a lot of misinformation out there, and the best way is to read what she has written for yourself, to get your own first-hand experience of what she has written. And her writings are freely available. We can find them online here at egwwritings.org. I encourage you, if you haven't read or if you haven't read much, I encourage you to, to log on there and to read what she has written. Think of beautiful books like The Desire of Ages on the Life of Christ or Steps to Christ on the Plan of Salvation or the Conflict of the Ages series going right from Genesis all the way to Revelation or even before um, the fall of man. I would also like to re recommend a very helpful portion from the book Seventh-day Adventists Believe on how the life, ministry, and teachings of Ellen White measure up to the biblical tests of a prophet. And I would like to share on those four primary tests and how Ellen White measures up to those tests. Agreement with the Bible, that first test. Her abundant literary production includes tens of thousands of Bible texts coupled often with detailed expositions. Careful study has shown that her writings are consistent, accurate, and in full agreement with the Scriptures. The accuracy of predictions, that's say, actually that, that was the fourth one that we looked at. Ellen White's writings contain a relatively small number of predictions. Some are in the process of being fulfilled, while others still await fulfillment. But those that can be tested have been fulfilled with an amazing accuracy. I invite you to check this out for yourself. Then Christ's incarnation, what we looked at earlier about the biblical teachings of Christ. Ellen White wrote, ex wrote extensively on the life of Christ, his role as Lord and Savior, his atoning sacrifice at the cross, and his present intercessory ministry dominate her literary works. Her book, The Desire of Ages, has been acclaimed as one of the most spiritual treaties ever written on the life of Christ. While Steps to Christ, her most widely distributed book, has led millions to a deep relationship with Him. Her works clearly portray Christ as fully God and fully man. Her balanced expositions fully agree with the biblical view, carefully avoiding the overemphasizing of one nature or the other a problem that has caused so much controversy throughout the history of Christianity. Her overall treatment of Christ's ministry is practical. No matter what aspect she deals with, her overriding concern is to bring the reader into a more intimate relationship with the Savior. And I can testify to this from my own reading of her writings. And then lastly, the influence of her ministry or the fruit of her ministry. More than a century has passed since Ellen White received the prophetic gift. Her church and the lives of those who have heeded her counsels reveal the impact of her life and messages. In summary, her influence has had a profoundly positive effect on the Seventh-day Adventist church corporately, and also on individuals personally who regularly read her writings. In the book Seventh-day Adventists Believe, it also states there how Andrews University did a study um, where they compared those who regularly read her writings with those who didn't. And they found that those who regularly read what she wrote had a closer walk with the Lord. They were more involved in mission. They were more... Um, generous, let me not misquote, you can find it in the book there, but there were many positive um, impacts through those who took heed to what she had written. 
There is also a very helpful portion in that same book on how we should view her writings in relation to the Bible. And I'll just briefly share those four points. And she herself would agree with these points, that the Bible is the supreme standard. She is not, her writings are not replacing the Bible. Her writings need to even be tested by the Bible. Her writings are also to be seen as a guide to the Bible. She desired to lead people back to the Bible and to the truths of the Bible. Thirdly, her writings can be used as an, a guide in understanding the Bible and a guide to apply biblical principles. She is very practical in her writings and she seeks to apply the biblical principles in, in everyday life. So we can see her writings as a guide to apply Bible principles. So in my personal experience, I've been greatly blessed through the writings of Ellen White. The messages she shares most definitely lead me and lead the readers closer to Jesus. So in summary, let me read our fundamental belief statement on the gift of prophecy. It reads this way. The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. There are the supporting scriptures as well. So I hope today you've learned something about the gift of prophecy. And I hope you are motivated to, to want to know more of what God has revealed to us in our day and age through the ministry of Ellen White. So based on our study today, I invite you to believe that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of prophecy. I invite you to believe that the gift of prophecy will be one of the identifying marks of God's end-time remnant church, as we saw in Revelation 12, 17, that they will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I invite you to test and to see for yourself that the gift of prophecy was manifested in the ministry of Ellen White. I invite you to read and apply the writings of Ellen White as God's special message, as God's special messenger for our time in earth's history. And lastly, I invite you to experience the blessing of believing in the Lord and in His prophets, as expressed in 2 Chronicles 20, which says, Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe His prophets, and you shall prosper. May that blessing be experienced, is my prayer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us pray as we end off this presentation. Dear Lord, I thank you that you have seen it fit that the gift of prophecy would be manifested in your end time church. Lord, thank you for the guidance, the instruction, the encouragement, the correction that you give to us through the ministry and the writings of Ellen White. Lord, I pray that you would help us to read and to apply and to share what you have blessed us with. Pray that you'd deepen our understanding of these important themes in our day and age. I pray for your blessing to this end in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for the I Believe presentation series. Please join us as we continue with our presentations. Thank you, friends. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sure you've got questions or even comments. Please feel free to send an email to the email below or reach out to us on any of our social media outlets. We are so, we are so glad to have you interact with us and we are praying for you as you discover what you believe.